Ralph, The Diary. Chapter 1. Burnley Abbey, Lancashire, England, 1794. Forward you cowards, charge the enemy, let them see the whites of your eyes. The sergeant shouted, urging his men forward, his red uniform spattered with mud. Musket shots were ringing out all around, and smoke billowed from the cannons. It was raining, dark clouds hanging over the battlefield, as the troops surged forward in a final, desperate charge. After the men. Don't let them get away, a young lieutenant called out, running forward into the fray, his sword drawn in an act of heroic example. But as he charged head-on into battle, a single bullet caught him in the chest. His arms flailed out, a cry emanating from his lips, his features contorted terribly as he fell backwards into the mud. Around him, the other soldiers looked on in dismay, scattering as their lieutenant lay dead in the mud. Teresa Baker awoke with a start. Her brow was sweaty, and she was shaking with terror, her heart beating fast. The nightmare had seemed so real. The lieutenant was dead, but who was he? She turned over, the bed creaking as she sat up. It was still dark, the grimy window of her attic room framing the night sky, where only the merest slither of a moon could be seen over the trees which grew next to the house. She sighed and stood up, shaking her head as she fumbled to pour herself a glass of water from the jug on the bedside table. Her hands were trembling, even as she tried to steady her nerves. It was only a dream, she told herself, though it had seemed all too real. That night was not the first night she had dreamed that same dream. It was always the same, the battlefield, the smoke, the musket shots, the rain, and the dead soldier lying in the mud. She could see his face, and whilst she did not recognise him, she felt certain she knew him, even as she feared to admit it. It isn't him, it isn't, she told herself, as though repeating those words would make them true. Her back was hurting, and she tried to stand up straight, finding it difficult in the cramped space of the attic. Her stomach was getting bigger, she was with child, and now it was starting to show, even as she was trying her best to hide it. She crossed to the window and wiped the pain with the palm of her hand. The inside was wet with condensation, and she shivered, peering out across the dark gardens towards the rolling moorland beyond. Only a few stars were visible amidst the cloudy sky, and she shook her head as a tear rolled down her cheek. It was only a dream. It's not true. He'll come back. I know he will. He'll come back for both of us, she told herself, placing her hands on her stomach, even as she feared the very worst. Teresa knew she would not sleep again that night, and even if she did, she was afraid of returning to the dream. It haunted her. A nightmare so vivid she believed herself to be there amidst the musket shots and cannon fire. But she was merely a passive observer, the battle raging around her as she watched the soldier felled by that deadly bullet. She could not bring herself to believe it was him, she refused to believe it was him. I won't believe it, she told herself, as she dressed for her early morning duties. The hearths around the house would need sweeping out, and the coal scuttles carrying up from the cellar. As the first light of dawn broke, Teresa splashed her face with water from the jug on the bedside table, and looked at herself in the broken shard of mirror which hung above the small dressing table in the corner of the room. She was an attractive young woman, olive-skinned, with deep blue eyes and curled black hair. She sighed, her cheeks were red, and her eyes filled with tears. Mrs. Mason, the housekeeper, was bound to chastise her. She barely tolerated her as it was, and Teresa felt certain that toleration would not continue once they discovered she was with child. Look at her, brazen with the child, they would say, shaking their heads, Teresa could just imagine it. She knew her time as a servant in the home of the Duke of Lancaster was limited, and she could only imagine what the Dowager Duchess would say when she discovered Teresa's condition.
The Duke himself was away fighting on the continent with his brother, and Teresa often saw the sadness of that separation in the dowager's eyes when she passed her in the corridors. I've got to stay strong, Teresa told herself, even as she was dreadfully afraid of what the future would bring. Teresa took a deep breath, knowing the challenges ahead of her were immense. She would soon give birth to her child, and what prospects would she, or the baby, have then? She had no family of her own, and she could hardly expect the household to support an unmarried servant giving birth amidst their walls. A day at a time Teresa, she said to herself, as now she left the attic room and made her way down to the servants' hall to begin her duties for the day. But as she worked, hauling coal scuttles up the stairs, and sweeping out the hearths, coughing and spluttering from the soot, her mind remained focused on one thing alone. The face of the dead soldier haunted her, his contorted features, his wide, lifeless eyes. She saw him everywhere she went, a man without a name, a man she feared to name lest her dream come true. It was a living nightmare, and one Teresa knew she would not escape from until she learned the truth of what was happening far away from Lancashire, in a distant land, where a war was being fought, the purpose of which she had never understood. I had a letter from Ralph this morning, the dowager said, as Teresa kneeled by the hearth in the drawing room where the old lady spent her days. Teresa looked up at her in surprise. The dowager never spoke to her. She was a mere maid, to be seen and not heard. Teresa set down her brush and rose to her feet, standing meekly before the dowager with her hands clasped over her stomach. The dowager sighed. He writes from the battlefield, my lady? She asked, and the dowager nodded, unfolding a piece of paper, and peering down at it. He gives an account of a recent battle. I don't like reading about it. The danger they're both in, my dear sons, it doesn't bear thinking about, and yet. I feel compelled to read. He hopes to be home in a few months, but this dreadful war rumbles on, and I can't see either of them returning soon, the dowager replied. Ralph was her son, the younger brother of the Duke of Lancaster, who was also fighting abroad in the same conflict. Teresa thought back to her dream, knowing all too well the fear of losing a loved one on the battlefield. The dowager looked tired, and older than she really was. Her hair was grey, arranged in a bun, and her face was wrinkled and forlorn. Teresa could vividly imagine the fear she was harbouring, and the prospect of motherhood brought with it an understanding for Teresa of just what the dowager was feeling as she read her son's letter. Then we must pray for that safe return my lady, Teresa said, and the dowager nodded. I do so every day she replied, shaking her head, and turning away, as a tear rolled down her cheek. Teresa felt terribly sorry for her. The duke and his brother had been gone for what felt like years, even though it had been only a matter of months, and each day, the dowager waited anxiously for news of what was happening in a far and distant land. Teresa kneeled down and resumed her sweeping, laboring over it for fear of leaving the dowager alone with her tears. My lady, she said, turning to the dowager, who looked up. What is it? She asked, and Teresa blushed with embarrassment. I'm sure they'll come back safely, she said knowing it was not her place to say such things, but wanting to offer words comfort, too. The slightest smile broke over the dowager's countenance, and she nodded with a sigh. I pray they will. But, well, we must bear the matter as best we can. They fight for a noble cause, or so they claim. But I can't help wondering if a faraway war on some distant island is worth it. How fragile life is, how easily it can be snatched away from us, she said, turning again to look out of the window. Teresa finished her sweeping, rising to her feet and curtsying to the dowager duchess before hurrying out of the room. She returned to the servants' hall, hoping not to encounter Mrs. Mason as she went, but at the bottom of the stairs leading up to the hallway, she came face to face with her nemesis.
I hope you've not been bothering her ladyship Teresa, she said, narrowing her eyes as she peered at Teresa with a stern expression on her face. Teresa shook her head. Mrs. Mason was a formidable character, always dressed in black, with a pinched nose and red face, her black hair combed back into an aggressive bob. No Mrs. Mason, I was just sweeping out the hearth in her ladyship's drawing room. I was just seeing to my duties, she said, and the housekeeper shook her head. Shirking your duties more like. You've become tardy recently Teresa. You're not working hard enough. What's got into you? The housekeeper said, fixing Teresa with an angry gaze. Teresa was struggling. She was growing tired more easily, and tasks like hauling the coal scuttles up the stairs to the bedrooms were getting harder. Soon, there could be no hiding the fact of her current state, and then what would become of her? I'm sorry Mrs. Mason. I'm doing my best, Teresa replied. The housekeeper's eyes narrowed. I've seen this in maids before. I know what can become of maids with loose morals Teresa, she replied. It was as though she suspected something, and Teresa drew a sharp intake of breath and returned her gaze defiantly. She was not ashamed to be with child, and whilst she knew what the other servants would think of her when they discovered it, she would not be cowed by their pious opinions. Her ladyship. Teresa began, but the housekeeper interrupted her. Her ladyship knows nothing about you Teresa. She's not your friend. I don't understand it, and perhaps I don't want to. But mark my words, if you put a foot out of line, I'll throw you out myself, whatever her ladyship says, she snarled, and pushing past Teresa, she clattered up the stairs to the hallway, leaving Teresa with tears in her eyes. They are all so cruel, Teresa thought to herself, pulling out a handkerchief to wipe her eyes just as a shout came from the kitchen. There are potatoes to peel Teresa. Get in here this instant, the cook, Mrs. Patterdidge, called out. Teresa was feeling tired. The dream had made her restless, and she wanted nothing more than to lie down and rest. But Teresa knew Mrs. Mason would gladly make good on her threat, and with no family of her own, and nowhere else to go she had no choice but to obey whatever orders were given her. Coming Mrs. Patridge, she called out, making her way down the kitchen corridor to the pantry, and heaving out a large sack of potatoes. The cook eyed her warily, and the kitchen maids tutted amongst themselves and shook their heads, it was clear they suspected something, and with each passing day, their suspicions would be realised. Teresa sat down at the kitchen table, pulling open the sack and taking out a pile of potatoes. This was her lot in life, but when the baby came, Teresa did not know what she would do. She could not go on working as a maid, nor could she hope to be treated charitably. And what if that terrible dream comes true? She asked herself, thinking of the face of the unknown soldier and fearing the worst. Chapter 2 Corsica 1794. Ralph Oakley hardly noticed the sounds of war these days. He would sleep through cannon fire, and the sudden shot of a musket no longer caused him to jump. He had become immune to it, and to the idea of death. When he had first arrived on Corsica, he had seen sights which had turned his stomach, men dying in the most appalling conditions or lying close to death with the most horrific injuries. But soon enough he had become numb to it, he was numb to war, numb to its effects, numb to his own feelings. It had not always been like that. He had come to Corsica to fight for king and country against French aggression. Theirs was a noble cause, defending against the barbarism of the French Empire. But war had worn him out, and his noble ideals had sunk like the cannons hauled through the endless mud of the battlefields. He was tired of fighting for a cause he no longer believed in and wanted only to return to the peace of the Lancashire countryside. He had never imagined himself to be a soldier, far less a lieutenant. That was his brother's domain, and Ralph had only joined the Duke of Lancaster's regiment out of loyalty. Now, 
He sat in his tent, close to the edge of the fighting, poring over troop reports and communications from far distant commanders, desperate for relief. It's all such a damned mess, he exclaimed, tossing aside the letter he was reading, as his batman looked up at him in surprise. Sergeant Scruton was a career soldier who had fought in a dozen conflicts for the Crown. His face was worn and weather-beaten, and a scar running the length of his right cheek served as a reminder of past conflicts. My lord! He said, and Ralph sighed, rising to his feet, and pacing up and down the limited confines of the tent, where a wooden desk, chair, and small table served as furnishings for a commander's office. All this, no one's winning. Both sides are losing. Every day, fresh casualty reports. We're far from home, fighting for a country we've nothing in common with. What are we doing here? He exclaimed. Every day, he felt ever more disenchanted with the expectations placed on him. He was meant to be a leader of men, but instead, he would gladly have allowed Nelson to fight his own war with France and leave Ralph out of it. His brother saw things differently, of course. The Duke of Lancaster had been personally sent by the regent himself to oversee the conflict, he was a close ally of Nelson himself and had asked Ralph to accompany him into battle. Ralph could hardly have refused. Following orders my lord, the sergeant replied, raising his eyebrows. Ralph scowled at him. The sergeant was only happy with a fixed bayonet in hand. But most of the men under his command were conscripts, forced into military service in exchange for bed, board, and a few pennies in wages each week. They were cowards, who held back at the moment of the charge. Many would have been in prison if it were not for military service, and far from the high ideals his brother espoused, Ralph saw only poorly trained and lazy men, who could not care less for honour or courage. I suppose so. But look at all these lives lost. It's a worthless conflict. And what does the Empire have to gain from it? Ralph replied. The sergeant smiled and shook his head. Isn't it obvious, my lord? A defeat for the French, on whatever frontier we find ourselves, is a victory. Isn't it? He asked. Ralph had to admit that much was true, and now he pushed his papers aside, unwilling to work any longer, now the evening was drawing in. The musket shots were growing less frequent now, pot shots taken across no man's land. The conflict was at a stalemate and neither side had made any advances for weeks. Attack, fall back, defend, attack, fall back, defend, those were Ralph's orders, and he was beginning to wonder if his brother and the other commanders had any plan at all. The victor would be the one who broke first, not the one defeated by the strength of the other. Food was running short, and the heat of the summer was slowly drying up their nearest water source a stream which provided a natural barrier between them and the enemy camp. A victory of sorts, yes. But I'm not sure it does much to change the lives of our countrymen back home. The French would never invade England. It's a preposterous thought. But the English would never invade France, either. Instead, we fight these skirmishes across whatever foreign borders the French might be pushing. We push them back, they push us back. It's a stalemate sergeant. That's all, Ralph replied. The sergeant nodded and went back to polishing the end of his bayonet. Ralph rose to his feet. He was hungry, and the scent of cooking was wafting into the tent from outside, another stew, made from the meat of whatever animal had been hunted that day. The sun was beginning to set, and he pulled back the flaps of the tent, emerging to a smart salute from a soldier whose ill-fitting uniform and muddied boots hardly matched the postured demeanour he now displayed. Sir! The soldier exclaimed, as Ralph walked past him. At ease, Ralph replied. He had never been comfortable with the unearned respect of the soldiers under his command. He was their leader by virtue of his rank and class, not because of merit. It was men like Sergeant Scruton who earned the true respect of the men. They were the ones who stirred them from their cowardice.
Ralph felt like a fraud, looking around him at the men, who sat in varying states of disarray, dipping stale bread into soup they ate from tin bowls, and eyeing him out of the corners of their eyes as he passed. Something to eat, sir? The cook asked, stirring a large vat of soup over a smouldering fire. Ralph nodded, handing the cook a bowl, into which was ladled a portion of the soup, which smelled far worse up close than it had done distilled on the air. Ralph took the bowl and turned to gaze across the battlefield. The scrubland of this part of Corsica was as far removed from the lush, fertile Lancashire landscape in which he had grown up. Ralph was used to woods and fields, meandering rivers, and rolling moorland. But this was very different, gnarled trees grew out of sandy rocks, stretching as far as the eye could see on one side, whilst on the other, tall, red-stoned mountains rose menacingly from the plain, beyond which lay the sea. He had been there for three months, and already he was forgetting what life back home was like. They stopped their pot shots for tonight. Perhaps we can sleep without the crack of musket, one of the men said. They'd be fools to fire a cannon at night, it doesn't stop them though, does it? Damn the French, another man said. Ralph ignored them. It was always the same conversations, and he wondered if the French commanders faced the same lack of woeful discipline and cowardliness in their own men. He sighed, sitting down at the base of a gnarled tree, and beginning to eat. The soup was foul, last week's offering with more water added, along with the bones of whatever animals the cook had roasted earlier that day for luncheon. It was a far cry from the meals Ralph was used to back at home. He grimaced and set down the bowl, sighing and resting his head back against the tree. The nights in Corsica were long and hot. Even when the sun had set, a residual closeness hung in the air, and sleep was hard to come by. Ralph yawned, wondering what his brother was doing at that moment. The forward command was outside a village some twenty miles to the north. Ralph had passed through there on the way to his posting, and Max had entertained him in what passed for the officer's mess, a tent in which stood a table with a candelabra and a decanter of brandy on top, French brandy of course. The sooner I'm home, the better, Ralph said to himself, gazing out towards the French lines, just as the sounds of horses' hooves caused him to look up. It was not unusual for messages to arrive at this time of the evening the battles of the day now fought, and their aftermaths ready to be picked over. The commanders on the front moved their troops around like pawns in a game of chess, with little regard for the cost of life. Ralph rose to his feet, watching as the horse rode along the stony track which came down from the north. One of the corporals went to meet him, and the messenger handed him a piece of paper, whispering something, so that the corporal's eyes grew wide. Right away, he said, and now he marched towards Ralph with an urgent look on his face. Are we being given our marching orders, Corporal? Ralph asked, but the Corporal shook his head. He was a fine fellow, a dependable sort amongst the dearth of the others, and Ralph was surprised to see the nervous look on his face, as now he handed the piece of paper over. You need to see this, my lord, he said, and Ralph unfolded the message. It was written in the usual form of a dispatch, addressed to him as company commander, but as he read it, Ralph's face turned pale. Be advised that at seven o'clock, on the evening of Saturday the 30th of July, an attack of the enemy led to the deaths of 22 British soldiers at Bastelica, amongst them, and most principally, Maximilian Oakley, the Duke of Lancaster. Further correspondence to follow. Yours, with deepest sympathy, Colonel George Roach, Commander, British Forces at La Casella. Ralph was shocked, reading the words, but hardly taking them in. His eyes grew wide, his hands trembling. His brother was dead. He read the words again, confused, as tears welled up in his eyes. No, it can't be. I, not Maximum. I... I don't know what to say. He can't be dead. He can't be. I don't, know, 
It's not possible, he exclaimed, but the corporal shook his head. The messenger told me the attack came by surprise from the east. There was an ambush. Your brother was killed in the first charge, my lord. They recovered his body, but there was nothing they could do for him, the corporal replied. Ralph shook his head. His brother was the bravest man he had ever known. A true patriot, who believed in the war and wanted to do his bit for the empire. The last time he had seen him, Max had been talking of returning home victorious in just a few months' time. He had poured them each a glass of brandy and toasted the end of France's influence on Corsica. We're going to win this Ralph. We're the finest army in the world. It's our destiny to be victorious, he had said. But now he was dead, and the bravado of his speech seemed to amount to nothing. Did the messenger say anything else? Ralph asked. Only that your brother died an honourable death, my lord. He led the charge with his sword raised and struck down by French musket fire. He'll be remembered as a hero, and given full military honours, the corporal replied. Ralph was still in a state of utter disbelief as to what had happened to the man he had looked up to his whole life long. Max was his example, the older brother he had always wanted to be like. It was because of Max he was here, and now he wondered how he could ever break the news to their mother. Her heart would be broken by it, and the thought of returning home without his brother filled him with dread. Sound the bugle horn corporal, we'll mourn my brother's death as he'd have wanted, as soldiers ready for the charge, Ralph replied, looking grimly across the French lines, his heart and mind burning with thoughts of revenge. Chapter 3 the Journey North, England, 1794 Ralph was not sad to leave the conflict in Europe behind. Stalemate had set in, and with the death of his brother, the British troops had lost one of their greatest leaders. Ralph had immediately informed Colonel Roach of his intention to return his brother's body to England. He had no intention of leaving his grave on a faraway shore and arrangements had been made for the transportation of his brother's coffin and his personal effects. Ralph had been relieved of his command by an eager young lieutenant, the son of a member of parliament, and Ralph had gladly relinquished his responsibilities against the French army, riding across Corsica with his brother's coffin following in a cart behind. A longboat ride had brought them back to Southampton via Gibraltar, and from there, Ralph had ridden north towards Lancashire. It was only when he had arrived back in England that Ralph had taken an interest in his brother's personal effects. He had not liked to open the trunk which had accompanied Max's coffin on the journey through Corsica, but curiosity had got the better of him, and he had opened the trunk at an inn on the road north. Inside, he had found only a few letters, some books, several military uniforms, and a sum of money. The letters were from their mother and contained much the same words as her letters to Ralph. He had still not broken the news to her, preferring to do so in person, rather than by written word, though he worried the dreadful news might already have reached her. It'll be easier that way, he had told himself, even as he could not imagine the words he would say, or what their mother would say when she discovered the truth. The two boys had always been close to their mother, especially after their father's death, and after such a long time away, Ralph feared he would find her deteriorated. He was nearly home, only a day or so more by carriage, and as he drove in his carriage through the lush English countryside, he thought back to all he had experienced in the past months and years. In his pocket was a diary. He flicked through, looking back over the years with interest, each day neatly recorded with a few lines of text. My brother and I are to be sent to Corsica. I don't know how I feel about it. Will we come back alive? Ralph read, as he searched out old entries. The words seemed prophetic, they were prophetic, and he shook his head, flicking back further to the days before he and Max had ever thought of the possibility of fighting the French on Corsica. Chapter 4 
Last night was difficult. Our last night together, snatched in secret. I'll miss her so much, he read, smiling to himself. They had left in such a hurry, called up to service with hardly any time to say goodbye. I left without with so much left unsaid, the future, what would happen on my return? We were ready to take a risk, marriage, family. I intended the honourable thing. Ralph did not want to read any more, and he closed the diary and slipped it back into his pocket. There were times when memories were pleasant, a reminder of happy days. But memories could also arouse bad feelings, and Ralph had enough to think about without worrying about the contents of a diary. The carriage bounced over a pothole in the road, and Ralph was thrown to one side, glancing anxiously out at the trailer behind, on which his brother's coffin was fastened. Hold on, Max, I'll get you home, he said to himself. He made the vow on the battlefield, even as the colonel had tried to dissuade him from such a foolhardy adventure. The journey across Corsica had been dangerous, and there had been times when Ralph had feared capture by the remaining pockets of French resistance. But he knew he was doing the right thing in returning his brother's body to the ancestral home. Burnley Abbey was the ancestral home of the Dukes of Lancaster, an ancient pile progressively enlarged by each generation. A church stood in the grounds, and it was here, in the family crypt, that his brother would be buried. They paused for the final night at an inn, and Ralph gave orders for his brother's coffin to be locked in one of the stables. The landlord welcomed him with great deference, telling everyone in the taproom of their prestigious visitor. Ralph would have preferred to have been anonymous, but he was treated as a returning hero, and hailed as the rightful Duke of Lancaster. It had not occurred to Ralph to think of himself in such terms. But it was true, he was the Duke of Lancaster. His brother had no heir, he was not married, and Ralph was his only relative in the bloodline. I'd much rather my brother was still alive than to wear a duke's coronet, he told one of the men in the taproom who had insisted on shaking his hand and congratulating him. The news of the duke's death had spread, and Ralph feared his mother would already know the terrible truth. He wanted to be the first to tell her and had issued strict orders that no one was to tell her in an official capacity. But his progress across the country had brought with it the same scenes as here, the discovery of his brother's death and news of his becoming the Duke of Lancaster was hailed with both sorrow and congratulations. If the rumour had spread faster than the carriage could carry him, Ralph knew he would return to Burnley Abbey to find his mother inconsolable with grief. But you're a hero to your grace. The periodicals are filled with tales of your exploits the man said, and Ralph was taken by surprise. He did not consider himself a hero and being referred to as your grace sounded very strange indeed. Max was the hero, leading the charge, killed on the battlefield and Ralph had grown up in his shadow. He was never meant to have been Duke. His upbringing had not prepared him at all for such a role. He missed his brother terribly and wondered how he could ever hope to fill his boots. There had already been talk of posthumous honours, and Colonel Roach had mentioned Max in dispatches. Ralph had no doubt his brother would be faked at the highest levels, and the funeral would be attended by the great and the good of high society and the military. It all felt very overwhelming. I don't believe I am, Ralph replied, returning to his drink, even as others told him the same, in their eyes, he was a hero, returning from the battlefield victorious. But in Ralph's mind, the return was a defeat. He would gladly have given up everything, the title, his wealth, the estate, the accolades, all for the return of his brother. We say you are your grace, and all of England says the same, the man said, and a chorus of voices agreed. Ralph nodded, finishing his drink, and rising to his feet. If you'll excuse me gentlemen. I think an early night is called for. I've a hard task ahead of me tomorrow, he said, nodding to the men, who now cheered as he left the taproom and made his way upstairs to the comfortably appointed bedroom the landlord had provided him.
A fire was kindled in the hearth, and candles were lit in sconces around the walls. It was an inviting scene. The blankets were pulled back, and the curtains closed across the window. Ralph pulled off his boots and sighed. Coming home had been precisely what he had wanted, but he had not expected to do so under such circumstances. When he and Max had left Lancashire, it had been with the scent of victory in the air. There had been no thought of them not returning together. Ralph had never considered such a thing, his brother was indestructible, or so Ralph had believed. The diary was on the table, and he picked it up and leafed through it, reading entries from the time before they had left England. I've a strange set of feelings towards the girl. I don't really know what to do, leaving her in England seems wrong, but I can't very well take her with me, I promised I'd write to her, he read, blushing at the meaning of these words and shaking his head. What a mess we left behind, he thought to himself. The landlord had left a decanter of brandy and a glass on the table, and Ralph poured himself a drink, holding it out towards the fire to warm it a little. He had dreamed of such luxuries on the battlefield and had looked forward to the moment of his return home with longing. But it all seemed empty now, devoid of any meaning. Without his brother, Ralph felt purposeless, even as he was now given the very purpose meant for Max and his heirs. I was meant to be nothing but the spare, he told himself, shaking his head as he took a sip of brandy. The role of the second son was always difficult to define. So close and yet so far. Third sons became clergymen, bishops even, and fourth sons could be found a portion of the estate to call their own. But the second son, and Ralph and Max were the extent of the family's offspring, was destined for the shadows. Only a terrible tragedy brought him forth, and Ralph sighed, knowing that tragedy had now befallen them. I only hope she doesn't know already, he thought to himself, picturing his mother's face if a servant or even idle gossip had broken the news of Max's death. Ralph want to be the one to do it. He would tell her immediately. There would be no long eulogy or talk of bravado and courage. He would lay the facts out to his mother as they occurred. Max had died on the battlefield. It was an honourable death, albeit a tragedy, and Ralph had brought his brother's body home to see it a proper burial could be enacted. It was the least he could do, even as he knew the guilt he felt was not reasonable in any way. Nevertheless, he did feel guilty about his brother's death, knowing how easily their fates could have been reversed. If only they had been. It should be me lying in the damned coffin, he told himself, pouring another glass of brandy, as tears welled up in his eyes. He knew it was idle to blame himself for his brother's death. He had not been there. He had not encouraged Max to join the military. His brother was a career soldier, who considered it the greatest honour to fight for the glory of the empire. It was Ralph who had been the reluctant one, and yet, still, guilt seeped over him, and with another sigh, he finished his drink in one and threw himself onto the bed. I should never have come back, he told himself, even as he knew how foolish he sounded. Ralph had always found duty difficult. He had shied away from it, avoided it even. But duty now called. A duty far greater than that he had borne in Corsica, the duty of the dukedom, and all that went with it. He opened the diary and flicked idly through the pages, sighing as he read through the accounts of day-to-day -day life before the mess of war had consumed him and his brother. And the matter of doing the right thing, he thought to himself, sighing again as he closed his eyes, knowing the next day would bring with it its own troubles. Chapter 4 Burnley Abbey, Lancashire, England, 1794 Teresa was peeling potatoes in the scullery. Mrs. Mason had confined her there, telling her to keep out of the way. Teresa was certain she suspected something. The housekeeper would be worried about the reputation of the household, 
for if it was discovered one of the maids was pregnant out of wedlock a scandal would ensue. Are those potatoes peeled yet, Teresa? You're taking an awfully long time about it, Mrs. Partridge said, appearing at the scullery door and scowling at Teresa, who looked up at her fearfully. I'm sorry Mrs. Partridge, it's just... I'm feeling tired, that's all, she said, and the cook narrowed her eyes and shook her head. I've no doubt you are Teresa. But we're all tired in this house. We're all overworked. We've no choice about it though. Get on with it, she said, as she shook her head and walked away. Teresa sighed. There was no point in arguing, and she could not tell the cook the truth. Mrs. Partridge would not be sympathetic to her. She would shun her, just as the other servants would do too. They would accuse her of being nothing but a harlot, free with her favours. She took up another potato and began peeling it, watching as the shreds of peel fell into the bucket of water below. Her back ached from bending down, and the gloom of the scullery strained her eyes. It's no place to bring a child into the world, she told herself, even as she knew there was no alternative, and nowhere else for her to go. Teresa knew the world did not look kindly on her current state. She was hiding herself away, fearing she would soon be unable to disguise the fact of her future. When she had finished peeling the potatoes, she hauled the bucket out to the kitchen, where the other maids looked at her with disdain, and Mrs. Partridge chastised her for leaving some of the skins still on. A fine job you've done Teresa, I'll finish them myself. Take the empty milk pails out to the yard and leave them for the farmer's boy. He'll be here first thing with the fresh ones. Go on, get a move on, the cook said, pointing to two empty milk pails standing on the side counter. Teresa made no reply, picking up the empty pails and making her way along the kitchen corridor and out into the yard at the back of the house. It was late summer and the days were still long, the sun just beginning to set over the gardens. She had always been happy at Burnley Abbey, having worked there as a maid ever since the death of her mother left her an orphan. She had always got on well with the other servants, but morals could so easily trump friendships, or so she had discovered, and now she was beginning to wonder if her place remained in service, or elsewhere. The other servants suspected her, there was no doubting that. Whoever heard of a servant with a baby? Even a married one, she asked herself, shaking her head sadly. The dowager had always been kind to her, but she could never legitimise the child of a servant born out of wedlock, and once the fact was discovered, Teresa would surely be sent away. It was simply unheard of to carry a baby in service, and Teresa was resigned to an uncertain future. She was just placing the empty milk pails in the dairy for the farmer's boy to collect when a whistle across the yard caused her to look up. It was Stanley Malley, the boy who ran errands from the village and brought letters and messages up to the house. Teresa, I've got something for you, he called out. He was only a young boy, thirteen or fourteen, and had not yet adopted the judgmental morals of his seniors. He was one of the few who had passed no comment on Teresa's current state, and now he hurried up to her, holding out a letter, which she took with surprise. For me? Are you sure? She asked, staring down at it in surprise. She was not expecting a delivery, and the arrival of a letter came as something of a surprise. No one wrote to her, even as her heart skipped a beat. He said he would write, but, it's been so long, she thought to herself, fishing in her pocket for a penny to give to Stanley for his trouble. I knew you'd not want old witch Mason to see it, or fatty partridge, Stanley said, grinning at Teresa, who laughed. You shouldn't call them that Stanley, she said, but the boy only shrugged. Mason clipped me around the ear yesterday for questioning her about the address for the doctor, she'd got it wrong. He lives at Greenacres, and she said to take a letter from the dowager to Fairacres. That's Mr. Johnson's place. And as for Fatty Partridge, she's never once given me anything to eat from that kitchen. I think she keeps most of what she makes for herself, 
that's why she looks like a partridge, he said, and he imitated the call of a game bird, much to Teresa's amusement. Well, thank you Stanley. It's very kind of you to bring this to me. I've no idea who it's from, though, Teresa said, and Stanley shrugged. I don't know myself, it came by the mail coach and I saw your name on it, and thought I'd bring it up to you. You're the only nice one here, he said, and Teresa blushed. That's very kind of you Stanley. I fear I won't be here much longer though, Teresa replied, glancing forlornly up at the house and shaking her head. Why's that? The boy asked, and Teresa sighed. She trusted Stanley, and now she looked down and placed her hands on her stomach. I'm going to. I'm not well, she replied, cutting off her words before revealing the truth. She may have trusted Stanley, but idle words could still cause problems. The boy looked at her sympathetically. You'll be all right. I tell you what, I'll call in on Dr. Graves. He's nice, he knows me now I've taken a few letters from the dowager. He might have something to help settle you, Stanley replied. At that moment, a shout came from the kitchen door, calling Teresa back inside. You're wanted in the scullery, one of the maids called out, and Teresa hurriedly stuffed the letter in her pocket and thanked Stanley once again for his kindness. I'll see you soon, he said, and he hurried back across the servant's yard, as Teresa turned to go back inside. She was ever so curious about the letter, wondering what it said. But she knew she dared not risk reading it until she was back in the safety of her attic room, with no one to spy on her or question what she was doing. Mrs. Partridge had a dozen jobs left for her to do, the nastiest, most unpleasant jobs, those avoided by the other maids, who sneered at Teresa as they sat down for their evening meal. But Teresa ignored them, excited at the prospect of opening the letter, and seeing who it was from. I just wonder if, oh, perhaps that awful nightmare won't come true. Perhaps he's alive, she thought to herself, as she sat down to peel another bag of potatoes. Teresa's hands were trembling as she pulled out the letter from her pocket later that night. It was late, and her attic room was lit only by a solitary candle. She had wrapped a blanket around herself and was sitting on the bed, holding the letter in her hand. She did not recognize the writing on the front, but then she was uncertain who could be writing to her, she was not expecting anyone to do so, not after so many months. Could it really be him? She opened the envelope, pulling out a piece of paper, and unfolding it. It was written in a large, spiralling script, and she struggled to read it, despite having been given lessons at her letters by the curate when she was young. Dearest Teresa, do not be afraid, all will be well. You are not alone. I promise you, all will be well. Ever yours. X. Teresa pondered the words, and the strange signature too. It had to be from him. He would not sign his own name, he would have known how easily such a letter could fall into the hands of Mrs. Mason or another of the servants. She breathed a deep sigh and smiled. It isn't true then. The nightmare isn't true. He's coming home. I can hardly believe it. After all this time, he's coming home, she said to herself, holding the letter to her beating heart. Tears welled up in her eyes. She had convinced herself her nightmare was true. That the man lying on the battlefield, even as she did not recognize him, was the man whose letter she now held in her hand. Her worries were gone, her fears would go unrealized, and Teresa sat back on the bed and sighed, elated at the prospect of seeing the man she loved once again. The months since he had gone away had been the hardest of her life, and the secret she bore had become almost unbearable. But none of that seemed to matter anymore. All that mattered was being in love, and she clutched the letter to her breast, imagining all that the future now held. I should tell the dowager.
If the war's over, she needs to know her sons are coming home, she thought to herself, even as heart and mind seemed at odds. But now she pictured the happy reunion to come, the kiss, the embrace, the feeling of finally being reunited after all this time. She was elated, and knew she would never be able to sleep that night, dream or no dream. Would that same dream still haunt her? How could it, now it had been proven false? But what will I say to him? Will it be just like before? She asked herself, for there were still so many unanswered questions. The letter said nothing of the time of the arrival, nor of what was expected of her. But it did contain a promise, and that promise was one she now clung to, filled with joy at the prospect of seeing the man she loved once again. I suppose the war might have changed him. War changes people, doesn't it? She told herself, even as she knew she had changed, too. Three months had been a long time. It had seemed endless, feeling all alone at Burnley Abbey, terrified at the prospect of her nightmares coming true. But the letter was proof they had not done so, and now Teresa could look forward to the happy prospect of reunion. She changed into her night things and climbed beneath the blankets, pulling them over her and leaning across to blow the candle out on the side table. She closed her eyes, imagining the moment she would see him. Will he kiss me? Will he embrace me? Or perhaps, he won't want to know anything about the baby, she said to herself, as a hundred different thoughts and possibilities raced through her mind. But Teresa reminded herself of their parting words. I won't ever forget you my darling, he had said, and she had believed those words and held steadfastly to them. She believed them, and now she was determined to remain hopeful for the future to come. She was about to give birth, and the father of her child was soon to return. Chapter 5 Burnley Abbey, Lancashire, England, 1794 It was raining as Ralph's carriage pulled through the gates of Burnley Abbey. His heart was heavy, like the inky black clouds hanging over the estate. He was not looking forward to what was to come. His brother's coffin had been covered by a tarpaulin, and Ralph glanced out of the rear window of the carriage, sighing at the sight of what he was bringing for their mother, news of her son's death, and the body of a duke. Unless she already knows of course, he said to himself, fearing he would find his mother in a state of devastation unable to cope with the tragedy of losing her firstborn son. He had rehearsed his speech a hundred times, but he knew words would fail him. As the house came into view, the house he had grown up in, familiar and safe, he shook his head, leaning back and closing his eyes. It had been winter when he and Max had left for the continent. Their mother had waved them off, the two brothers filled with bravado for the excitement of what was to come. But war was not exciting, Ralph had learned as much in the months of his exile on Corsica. War was overwhelming, it was the devil's work, and it dragged men to their lowest depths. Ralph was tired of war. He viewed his brother's death as pointless. Heroic, but pointless. And now we pay the price, he said out loud, as the carriage drew up on the forecourt outside the house. He had sent no word of his arrival to his mother. She would only have wondered as to the truth of why he was returning with no mention of his brother. Only one person knew of his arrival, and that had been a secret, communicated in haste from an inn to the south. As they pulled up, the door of the house opened, and the butler, Mr. Gregson, appeared, looking somewhat confused at the sight of the trailer behind the carriage. My lord, we weren't expecting you, he said, and Ralph breathed a sigh of relief. The butler had no idea he was speaking to the Duke of Lancaster, even as his gaze went to the tarpaulin-covered coffin, and his expression suggested a dreadful realisation. Now, Ralph broke the sorry news to him, instructing him to tell no one, and take him immediately to his mother's sitting room, 
before seeing to it the coffin was brought inside. Mr. Gregson had turned quite pale, and kept glancing at the tarpaulin, nodding, as he led Ralph into the house. If he had expected things to change, he was mistaken. The same scent of beeswax polish hung in the air, mixed with the familiar summer scent of cut flowers, displayed in a large vase on the table in the hallway. In the summer months, his mother prided herself on always having freshly cut flowers in the house. I'm glad my mother doesn't know the truth. I want to be the one to break it to her, Ralph said, as they came to the door of his mother's sitting room. Will you tell the servants, my law? Your grace? The butler asked, and Ralph nodded. Have them assemble in the dining room. I'll speak to them after I've spoken to my mother, he replied, raising his hand to knock at the sitting room door. Ralph was all too aware of what that knock would mean. His mother was a gentle creature, kind and thoughtful. She would be reading or embroidering, or perhaps writing invitations to a social gathering. She played the pianoforte and was a prominent member of several local charitable societies. Ralph loved her dearly, and the thought of breaking her heart with the news he bore was almost too much to bear. Come in, his mother called out, and Ralph opened the door, his heart heavy at the task which lay ahead. His mother looked up in surprise. She was sitting by the window, her favourite place to look out over the garden, and was embroidering, even as she now set the embroidery aside and rose to her feet. She looked at him, and the expression on his face must have told her the truth he was about to speak. Tears welled up in her eyes, her hands trembling as she clutched at the mantelpiece, and Ralph hurried towards her. He's dead, isn't he? She stammered, I can see it in your eyes, and Ralph nodded. His mother let out an agonized groan, almost falling to the floor as Ralph caught her in his arms. His speech, the words he had prepared, meant nothing. She had known, as only a mother could know. I'm sorry mother. I brought him home. I couldn't tell you any other way. I couldn't write. I had to be here. I had to tell you myself. He fought bravely. He was mentioned in dispatches. He died an honourable death, Ralph said, even as his words seemed to mean nothing. He no longer cared about honour, or heroism. It was those values that had sent his brother to the grave. Tears rolled down the dowager's cheeks, and she sank back into her chair, as Ralph went to kneel at her side. He took her hand in his, gazing up into her eyes with utter sorrow in his heart. No words could comfort her. She was inconsolable, just as he had known she would be. They held one another, and Ralph wept the tears he had so stoically held in since the news of his brother's death had reached him. You brought him home though. You did what a brother should do, his mother said, and in these words, some of the guilt Ralph was feeling was alleviated. He had done nothing wrong. He had not led his brother to his death and now he had returned home to take up the duty left to him. That was what Max would have wanted, even as Ralph knew he still had another difficult task ahead of him. I need to tell the servant's mother, he said, and his mother looked up at him through her tears. Yes, you must, oh how dreadful. I didn't want him to go. I didn't want either of you to go. Lost on some far-off battlefield, she said, and Ralph rose to his feet and took a deep breath. He left his mother sitting by the window, gazing sadly out across the garden. Her grief was silent now, not as he had expected it, even as it seemed she had almost prepared herself for this dreadful eventuality. Out in the corridor, Ralph sighed, leaning back against the wall and shaking his head. How dreadful this all is, he said to himself, stealing himself for what was to come. The servants were gathered in the dining room, and Ralph entered the room, looking around him at the samba, expectant faces. It seemed they too, knew what was to come. His grace has something to say to you all, the butler said, and his words, of course, told the servants everything they needed to know.
Mrs. Mason, the stern housekeeper, gasped, her usual emotionless demeanor breaking for a moment as a look of horror spread across her face. It's not easy to say this to you. And I'll keep my words short and to the point. But Mr. Gregson's words are correct. Your grace is correct, which can only mean one thing, I've inherited the title of Duke of Lancaster, my brother's dead. He died on the battlefield in Corsica, fighting against the French, he said, hardly believing the words coming from his own mouth. The servants gasped, turning to one another and whispering. It can't be, one of them said, shaking her head as tears rolled down her cheeks. I'm sorry, but it is. From this moment, Burnley Abbey is in mourning. Mr. Gregson will give you your instructions, including the date of the funeral, once it's arranged. The Dowager Duchess is understandably in shock. I ask you to make every provision for her, and for myself, as I learn a new role as head of the family, Ralph said. The servants shook their heads. Some were crying, and Mr. Gregson and Mrs. Mason ushered them out. Only one remained behind, the maid whose name was Teresa. She looked at Ralph with a sad expression on her face. I'm sorry your grace. Truly sorry. You must be hurting terribly, she said, and Ralph nodded. Thank you. Teresa. It's not been an easy time. My brother died a heroic death. He'll be remembered for that. It's something of a comfort, he replied, giving her a weak smile. I'd like to come to the funeral. The Duke was always kind to me, she continued, and Ralph nodded. I'd like that too. The servants will all be welcome, as will my brother's friends. My brother cared deeply for this estate and the people who work here, too. Thank you, you're very kind, he said and the maid curtsied and left the room. It had been kind of her to speak those words, and Ralph knew his brother would have wanted him to take care of the servants, as well as their mother. It proved how rightly respected Max had been. He was liked by everyone, the servants, the men under his command, those in the highest echelons of society. Ralph felt somewhat despairing, how could he ever hope to fill his brother's shoes? The house, the title, the responsibilities, they all seemed so overwhelming. Ralph had never been prepared for such a task. His brother had seemed invincible, but now he made his way to the library where Max's coffin had been placed. It was draped with his own standard, that of the Dukes of Lancaster, and four catafalque candles burned at the corners. A tear rolled down Ralph's cheek, and he shook his head, placing his hand on the coffin. I'll do my best maximum. But I so wish you were still here. Why did you have to leave me with this burden? He asked. The room was silent, save for the pitter-patter of rain on the window over to which Ralph now crossed and looked out over the vast expanse of parkland which made up the Burnley Abbey estate. It was all his now, his responsibility. He had never imagined it would be so even as the dreadful weight of what lay ahead now rested heavily on his shoulders. And now I've no choice but to step up to the mark. I wasn't a very good soldier, not really. Will I be a better duke? Surely not compared to my brother, Ralph said to himself, lamenting all that was to come, and fearing he would be nothing but a failure. What is going to happen to Teresa and her child? What kind of secrets is Ralph about to discover? What scandal will trap them both in a romantic adventure full of mysteries and danger? Find out more in the first full novel in the Dukedom Secret series. Ralph. Thank you for watching. More audiobooks are coming extremely soon. Until then, watch one of the following videos. Please press the like button. Subscribe and hit the notification bell to not miss any new audiobooks. It helps very much with YouTube's algorithm. Follow us on social media and visit our eShop at www.starfallpublicationsbooks.com to receive hot offers.
Save 10% on your first order using YouTube 10 code at checkout.